Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our new session of NEC TV Series Europe. I am Thibaut Giri, Market Analyst for DataXis. And today we have the pleasure to host Patrick Bearden, Head of Sales Engineering at TiVo, and Miguel Rodriguez, the Group Head of TV Product at Vodafone. Before letting you introduce yourselves and start this conversation, let's have a brief overview of uh, what we are going to discuss this morning. As we are all aware, uh, the streaming and OTT video markets in general have been growing tremendously over the last five years. We have a steady 30% growth in terms of subscribers year on year in Europe on average. The market has become increasingly competitive too, with more than 30 new platforms launched over the last four years in the continent. And with the more platforms, the more content, the huge diversity of content available and its increasing fragmentation with the successive launches of D2C services from major media companies has led to increasing difficulties for the consumers to easily find and enjoy their content. And while aggregation was supposed to help them ease the search of content, it can sometimes be overwhelming. And one of the most promising fields uh, in order to solve this issue is voice search. And this is where our speakers today will focus on the role of voice search in this super aggregated world. Maybe, uh, Miguel, you want to start and tell us a bit about uh, Vodafone's journey in the OTT business and how voice has become uh, increasingly important for your services. Sure. So as we deploy our service now in multiple markets, uh, we've seen that uh, the content is having this huge transformation. So you used to have content uh, usually in channels, so you could very easily move from one channel to the next just with a click of a button. You could have features like an electronic program guide that would show you all the channels and all the content available. You could have a search that would compass all the content you have. Uh, and then you had VOD, which was also in side of your platform. And in the last couple of years, this has uh, transformed completely. So content is now much more inside of applications and has more and more investment goes into those uh, big partners and big applications. Content is migrating away from these more traditional uh, channel-based uh, uh, ways of seeing the content. And I think for Vodafone, we have seen that uh, for us, it is important to obviously have that content available for all of our users. And so we have focused a lot on having the best partnerships so that our users can have access to that content. And I think in this, in this new way of working, you, you have, as an operator, you have to ask yourself, where are you adding value? And for us early on, that was understanding that customers, when they look at these different applications and the content inside of those applications, they're still very much independent from one another. So there's nothing linking the experience within one application to the experience of a second application. And that creates some frustration. It creates some frustration in building. It creates frustration in discovery, in user navigation, in search. And so we thought that an independent uh, operator that could pick up all of these different applications and then provide some value to connect them would be where we want to play. And I think we've started some of this with personalization uh, together with TiVo, and we've now expanded that into voice. And voice comes up as one of the big value adds for a customer because you can flatten this experience and you search once and you find it in all the applications. And so that has been a little bit our journey and how we're investing in voice so that we can bring the best features and add value to this ecosystem. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, thank you first for hosting this session. Um, from your point of view as a video solution provider, how did you see this market evolving first? And how did you see, for instance, the needs of operator evolving too? And how you started this relationship with uh, Vodafone? And what have you been able to do so far together? Yeah, thanks, Tibo. I, I think we sit in a good position because we, we, we work with people like Miguel and people like Vodafone. But in, in the United States, we're an operator too. So we, we see firsthand some of the trends Miguel is talking about. I like the way Miguel phrases it. You know, where, how do we add value in that ecosystem if you have multiple OTTs, for example? And we've, we've done some studies around how many of these services people typically have. And at the moment, it's it's you know, up to seven different OTT services in an individual household. So 
we have the same problem on our own products, but we try and work with people like Vodafone to see how can that, how can we help there. And obviously, as Miguel says, by flattening that experience, by flattening that search experience, basically making it easier to find content. I think as, as an industry, we have struggled with, with UIs, with all the content that we have coming from all these different sources, and it just grows every day, right? A new, a new service launches every day. So how do we make it easier for people to find content that they want to watch? And I think that's the journey that we've been on. I mean, we, we started in, in voice solutions probably about seven years ago was our first deployment. But since then, this kind of aggregation of content has really exploded. And it's been a nice kind of crossover because it's allowed us to use that technology to solve a new problem. And that new problem is this, this kind of OTT world that, that Miguel describes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to the potential of voice then. How voice functionalities have evolved over the last years and how has evolved your, the partnership between the two companies over the last years? Maybe Miguel, you want to handle uh, this issue first? Sure. So I think when you, when you start uh, doing your first voice uh, deployments, you will quickly see that voice is heavily dependent on how you teach users those use cases. And a lot of people uh, nowadays have um, devices, assistant devices at home, but when you work with TV, it's a lot about what you tell people that you can do. And if you build a commercial that explains to people how they can discover new content, you will immediately see that people are doing those exact sentences that they saw in the commercial, they're doing them at home and they're trying it out. So I think the first part, that was important for us was understanding that this isn't a feature like other features that people can just figure out by themselves. And I think, yes, some people will do that, but you can be a lot more successful if you are giving hints, if you suggest things to people, if you teach them how to use the service. And in a lot of ways, we saw that um, there are people that actually do a bit of uh, everything in voice. So there are people who use voice to just discover content because it's really hard to type in uh, a big uh, name, for example, of a movie. But there are a majority of people were just using it for the things that they do normally, like changing the channel. You know, you don't need to know that your favorite channel uh, is now on position 134. Uh, you maybe don't remember that documentary channel if it was on 35 or 36. And with voice, you don't need to anymore. And so for us, uh, we started there. So we started with normal use cases that people usually already do on remote controls. How can we transform them, make them easier, uh, kind of remove that frustration away from search. But then we quickly evolved into uh, a lot of interesting ideas. And I think uh, TiVo has been uh, really an amazing partner in bringing those ideas and uh, seeing what else can we give to our customers. And we're now looking at things like, for example, if you uh, turn on your TV and you say, uh, continue watching my favorite show, this might seem like a very natural thing to do, but it's full of meanings. So first of all, when you say my favorite show, you're talking about yourself. So does the system know who you are? And how is that different if I'm the one speaking it or if my wife is saying the same sentence? So you need to understand things like this. And when you say my favorite show, how does the system know that it's your favorite show? And then how does it know which episode you should start your favorite show? And I think when you start putting all these pieces together, like a good recommendation engine, a good system that knows in which episode you were on, a good system that understands what you usually like to do and so it knows what your favorite show is then when you put all of this ecosystem together you can answer something simple like i just want to continue watching my favorite show and i think these are the things that we believe uh, will improve the lives of our customers because they don't need to go through a number of steps to find something and we all know the frustration of you're watching a series and when you enter into an app you suddenly see three new rows of trending content and of new things. And you just want to continue watching the series that you were watching, but it's deep down because obviously people want you to see new stuff. And so these are some of the frustrations we're trying to take away. And we do see voice evolving in a lot of use cases like this that make it easier for, for our customers. And Patrick, from your own point of view, how, for instance, you offer Evolve to help the operator to tackle this new issue, especially in terms of this overwhelming content offer and the difficulties to uh, provide the customer the best experience they want. Yeah, 
I, I think Miguel just stole all the good answers. That was, that was <laughs> I did, what, what he said is my answer. But but basically, I think you know where, where we can improve. I think so. The, if you have you have building blocks in a, in a voice solution, you have ASR, which is the speech recognition, and that that has got so good over the last five years. You know the the, the accuracy percentages are very high because they're used across all the products that Miguel references, all the home devices. So it's it's it, that's really you know almost. I wouldn't say commoditized, but it's it's almost as good as it's going to get. But the piece in between um, is the natural language understanding, and and I think that understanding piece is where we really focus all of our effort, and where I think you know there's always room for more improvement because the use cases like you know continue watching my favorite program, as Miguel says, that you can break that down into so many different components about what's actually happening in that sentence, and I think you know we put a lot of effort through our AI tools to try and pull together what, what all that means and to understand the query. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, the, the phrase content is king. Well we, well, we talk about context is king, right? So you, you need to understand the context of who's speaking, what time of day is it, what kind of device are they talking on, what have they been watching for the last 30 days, and what are they, what are they going to watch next? So we put a lot of effort into that, combining the kind of search and recommendation skills with the NLU side. But I think where we can improve is, and, and again, Miguel kind of hinted towards this, is you know if, if I speak versus if my wife speaks, then actually we can use biometric tools to understand that, okay, I watch slightly different content at a certain type of day than, than my wife did, for example. So you know I might like to watch sport at a certain type of day. So if I just turn on TV and say, show me what's on tonight, what's on tonight you know, maybe I get the Euro Europa Cup final last night, maybe my wife gets a different experience. So we're looking at exploring how do we use biometrics to actually create personalized profiles and then take it to another level. And I think we've, we've talked before about the, the first really killer use case that we see for that is around kids, because kids have not just personalized content, but there should be some guardrails when kids are in a video service as to you know, how the video service performs. Um, Miguel's team have a, have a really cool kids um, zone in the VTV product and it's 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 you know it's different right Miguel it's not it's not the same UI it's not the same experience as you see in the kind of native adult version so where we see it is if you could use biometrics and use voice as an entry point and an exit point to that then it just becomes so natural and uh, the experience is, is there's no barriers to that so if one of my kids speaks and they say you know uh, show me my favorite show they get taken into a kid zone where all of that content is just spe specifically for kids. And then when I pick up the remote and I say, where's my favorite show, then I get exited from the kid zone and brought into an adult area. So I think that's going to be probably the, the kind of the first use case that you're going to see biometrics really pushing forward, but ultimately it's going to lead to personalization. And again, you know, in the kind of aggregated world where you've got so much content, what I want to watch, even versus what my wife wants to watch, or you know what you guys want to watch, is different. And and with so much content, I think one of the cool things about voice and, and biometrics, especially, is it allows you to find that long tail content that maybe wouldn't be so obvious in the UI. So when Miguel talks about you know trending as the first carousel, I mean I think in some of our products, trending is the first carousel in, in, in that you see. And I, I you know you understand why that is. But a lot of us already know roughly what we want to watch. And voice just, again, just flattens that experience. It could take you to a, you know, a slightly left field movie that would never appear on a UI. But if they know the kind of content that I like, then you know, I get there quicker. So I think, I think a deeper level of personalization, Thibaut, if your, your answer is where next, I think, I think that's where we see the future. And I think it's also interesting that uh, we tend to see the problem through our own eyes and how we use our experience. But there comes a point where we need to see that we are not most of the times the typical user behind a, a TV service, right? And yes, we maybe are one of the types of users, but we're probably the type of user that adapts the best. And you know, if I have a remote or if I have a voice system, I'll be happy. But that, uh, in a sense, there are other classes of users that are taking a much fuller advantage of these voice services. And for example, if you think about older people or very young people that in some cases i remember when my kid when we launched a voice service with evo my kid didn't know how to use a remote and so when he pressed the single button it's the only button that he knows 
uh, and he would just say Peppa Pig. I mean, he couldn't even uh, put up a full sentence. He would just say Peppa Pig and he can watch it. That's really powerful because that, that customer that you have, he was not able to interact with the service before and now he can. And in a lot of these cases, if you, you need to think about all the people that watch TV because TV has everyone behind it. So you, you will have people with disabilities. You will have, there's a lot of accessibility uh, issues within our current services. And voice might sound like this good step for us in the right direction, but it's a massive step for people that, for example, have disabilities and that need to use voice to be able to use the service. Uh, and uh, if you think about this, and if you think about all these use cases, or if you're uh, doing something in the kitchen and you, you don't want to go and grab the remote, that's also a, a nice use case for you. But there are a lot of classes of people that voice is gonna be massive for them. And I think when you, when you start thinking a little bit about what you can do and uh, what you can do, not just for these people, but in terms of use cases, I think Patrick, you were talking about the biometrics. Um, profiling has been a nightmare for operators. And I think it's very easy for an app to say, whenever you open the app, you choose a profile and then you're in. For an operator, you can never do that. I cannot, when I turn on my TV, I cannot stop the video and just put up a screen and it stays black for you to choose a profile. That, that's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So I think for the first time, we're redesigning some of these features and we're bringing advantages to some classes of people that have not seen these advantages before. Um, and I think that would be massive. So maybe it looks like nice for us or a really cool feature, but I think it's going to be a massive difference for some of these people. Yeah, and I, I think just, just to touch on one point, the accessibility point is really interesting because I agree, we, we haven't as an industry done a great job to you know, make, make video accessible to, to everybody and people with disabilities. And what, one of the things that we've been exploring recently is um, next generation audio. So NGA is, is, is something that's been around as, a, as, a, as an ambition for some time, but hasn't quite made it into the video space yet. And we work with, so as part of TiVo, as part of Xperia, as part of Xperia, there's DTS, which is, you know, does a lot of work around audio standards and codec. Um, we've been working with that team to see if there's actually voice applications that we could assign to some of the next generation audio. So for example, you know, if you have somebody with, with disability, with a hearing disability, sometimes it's difficult to make out different noises on a video screen. So things like background noises versus actually dialogue, what's, what's important. So we've been exploring that and, you know, voice as, a, as, a, as a, an access point would be a great way to control that, right? If you could say, turn off the background noise just by using your voice, that would be a fantastic use case. And, and we've been talking about, it. it's been really interesting um, through COVID, um, if you guys have noticed, if you guys watch soccer, if you watch any sport, they've been piping in uh, fan noise. Have you seen this? Is this a, it's a common thing? Yeah. So uh, we've been watching that and thinking, okay, that's interesting. That's like, you know, now they're actually playing with the audio stream. They're bringing in a kind of third party audio stream. And one of the providers, one of the bigger providers who I won't name, um, their way around it was actually to have two channels. So you could have one channel with the fan noise and one channel without the fan noise. I mean, that's pretty that's pretty inefficient, right? That's Miguel, you probably know better than me, but you know, having having two HD channels streaming the same content with different audio is not is not the most efficient way of doing it. So why not have a voice solution where you say turn on fan noise, turn off fan noise? And so we're starting to really explore that. I think and, and accessibility is, is an area I think we need to get better at. And I think this would be the way to do it. So before moving on to the other application in the global entertainment uh, business, uh, I wanted to have a brief question about um, the way that you are, your customers have um, adopted the voice functionalities. So obviously I presume that not all of them are doing it full time. So how do you manage to create personalized experience even for those that are not very aware or accustomed to voice functionalities? Uh, do you provide them also a mix of other content discovery functionalities? How do you educate them to use, the, to use them more? Or do you provide like different, completely content discovery experience? Yeah, I, I, can, um, 
I think um, you, it goes a bit into uh, what I was discussing about how do you teach people how to use those discovery services, uh, but also uh, being uh, understanding and, and knowing that if people are used to doing something and if they like, for example, to go through the first rail and, and see you know, the trending content, and I don't want to use voice in that specific use case, that's fine. You shouldn't force them to use that. So I think we're, we're not replacing completely all of the functionalities that you used to do. You're bringing one additional way that it's much easier, but you're bringing one additional way of finding that content. And you need to you need to put this out there and, and uh, teach users uh, how to do it. You will uh, have hints on your UI saying, have you tried searching for your favorite movie or your favorite actor? Uh, have you tried uh, tuning to the channel by just saying the name of the channel? And so when you start giving these hints and when your marketing approach is consistent with teaching that this feature is there, then I think people will start using it. And one of the challenges that we'll have as an operator is, um, your, your marketing cycle and investment cycle, when it starts with a feature, it usually then goes down or it just continues to other features. And one of the challenges is how do you keep this in, in the top of your marketing ability so that people don't stop using it? And obviously you need to have a very good experience to start with, but you will see that there will be a slowdown because obviously your commercials are not going to be in the air forever. Uh, so people need to... Uh, think about uh, the features that you've provided to them and then know that they exist so that they can continue using them. And if you consistently bring that up to attention and say, look, have you tried to do this? Have you tried to do that? Then I think you see a much more um, consistent way of, of using voice uh, rather than if you imagine you just do one commercial and then you never talk about it for the next two years, then you just see a huge bump. People use voice and then they forget about it and then they don't use it, or a very uh, reduced number of people use it. So I think that's some of the things that you need to pay attention for when you're trying to teach users how to discover content, because some people obviously will remember about this, they will know that you can do it, uh, but you, you, don't, you don't want this to be a gimmick. You don't, you're not putting the feature out there so that when you have your friends over, you can say, oh, look at this, I can do this in my TV. And then you never use it again for the next two months. That's not what you want to do. You want to have something that people use in their day-to-day -day lives and that makes it easier for them so that you create that stickiness in your service and people are really fond of using voice as a normal way to interact daily with your TV. And I think that's the biggest challenge is not just saying, look, I now have this super cool thing. Look, I've launched it. And then you don't talk about it. You need to continue talking about it. And I think that's that to me is is key for this discussion today. Yeah, and I think I think um, continue to evolve the product, right? It needs to, you know, people people's expectations are quite high because of their use to talking to other devices, and you know, it's 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 everywhere, right? It's at home. It's in more so in the car now than ever, um, and you ask it more unusual questions, and you expect a response. So I think. Miguel, I know it's something you're, you know, the, the, the concept of multi-domain of, of what, what next, what, what are the next kind of queries or next type of queries that we're, we're going to see. And I think that's something we, we look at a lot as well. It's, it's it, you know, people will use it and, and you educate them and you try and get them to use it in different ways. But if you continue to evolve the product, people stay loyal. And then you can also see people coming along and then you can start adding more, using more commercials, like different types of commercials. Because like, no matter how many times you get a, a good looking actor to use a remote control to say, find Game of Thrones, you know, it's, it gets stale. So we're, what we look at is we look at these adjacent domains. And Miguel, I don't know, you, you're, you're interested in that area too, right? Yeah, so I think um, when you look at, so if you believe you've done a good job on the existing categories, then uh, obviously you need to look at the next categories and what are the things if you have a big screen if, if you're if you have a privileged way of interacting with that big screen and you have a voice system that uh, in some cases might be uh, either on a remote controller it might be far reach if you have those then what else can you do to bring that value to your customer and that might not just be around the traditional TV. Uh, we've seen that there are other experiences in your home that could benefit from having a big screen and having a voice system. So when you think about the, the new stuff that exists out there around, you know, to give a couple of examples, imagine you have 
your doorbell that now is a lot more intelligent than it used to be. Uh, if there's someone there, you can uh, ask it to be uh, on the TV whenever that happens. Or if you're doing a shopping, for example, through one of the normal assistant devices, uh, that's usually done in a blind mode, you could do that on the big screen with voice. So for us, there's a big discussion around um, <clears throat> what do I do next? What are the things that I can bring to a user's home? Uh, he watches uh, a lot of video content, but he also plays games at home. So can I do something within that space? He uses, for example, when the set box is off, he likes to use Spotify to listen to music. What can I do in voice to bring that experience? And in a lot of these cases, people don't really think about this. But if you say, if you're in your living room and you say, uh, play Spotify, uh, does that have already a use case today or can we have a play into that space? And there are a lot of use cases like this that you today use in your living room that can be breached with voice. Uh, and if you have an operator that is kind of picking up all these different strings and putting, putting them all together into a single system that will in the end provide value to the customer. So we do see that there's a lot more to do rather than just TV uh, and bringing some of these uh, ecosystems that already exist in the home and linking them together, kind of similar to what we're doing with the apps and the aggregation. I think that will have uh, some nice value for our end customers. So you talked about consistency and uh, product improvements. When we think about TV, we mainly think also about video, but as you were starting to say also, we can aggregate also audio and every type of IoT. What can we expect in the future in terms of uh, functionality of improvement, in terms of uh, content aggregation, in cloud gaming, in audio, in other type of entertainment? Uh, Patrick, for instance, I think you work on that a lot on the perspective side. Yeah, I, I think so. I think um, so. Th there's a there's a few levels to that question. I mean, one of the things is 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 we are in our own Tebow products. We're starting to personalize apps as well. So we're starting to recommend different apps to customers based on what they've watched before. So we have this concept of a of a, a match score. So if you like certain content from a video provider, you might like this app as well, and we give it a naught to a hundred score. But you, know, you could imagine extending that to other apps and to other domains. So it might be, it might be music, it might be sport is an interesting one, right? So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of news around sport in the last couple of days about, you know, sport has always been, as a second screen, you think your mobile phone and you watch on the big screen. There's been some big providers, Vestel made an announcement yesterday that they're trying to move that all onto the big screen because they believe that's where that should sit. Um, so sport becomes an interesting domain. Customer service becomes an interesting one, you know, far less sexy, but could probably save you some money if you can just get people to use a voice solution on the TV rather than calling your call center. So we see these, you know, adjacent domains. We need to be careful in terms of, we don't want to become a, a voice assistant in the home. You know, what we do is very entertainment centric and, and we, we, we very much focus on that. And I think that's, that has a real value. Um, but I do think, you know, the kind of the, the smart TV or, you know, the, the, the TV as a solution in the living room, IOT, you know, TV, you reference IOT, and, you know, this is, this is a term that's been around for a long time. And it, it, it feels like possibly now is actually starting to gain real traction because when we talk to our customers, they start talking about doorbells, they start, start talking about home security, they start talking about you know, energy bills, can you control all of that through one experience and have one provider? So Vodafone already own some of those, could they extend that to something like security? I think that's an interesting development that's starting to gain real traction. And again, you know, why not use voice for those? Um, kind of as Miguel said, it's not just a, you know, it's not just about video content, maybe content is just a whole ecosystem in the home and maybe voice comes the gateway to that, to that ecosystem. Okay, Miguel, maybe I leave you the final thoughts uh, because we're already at the end of uh, these conversations. Sure, so I think the, the way that you'll see operators going and I think uh, in voice progressing uh, has a whole, has a feature, it will be very much dependent on the value that you can bring to, to the customers. And if you bring that value consistently with improvements and updates, and if you're 
constantly respectful of the privacy that your customers have. Uh, I think that will play, you will be seen as a sort of different player in a world of many different technology companies, but you'll be seen as a trustworthy player that brings some value to the things that I do in my day-to-day -day life, and that makes it easier. And I think the more we do that in the future, the happier our customers will be. And obviously that will be the degree of success that you'll have in your, um, in your service and with the customers that you have. Patrick, anything you want to add before we end this conversation? No, I, I, think, I think, you know, in terms, of, in terms of the future, which is, you know, what, what everybody wants to talk about and what, what we spend a lot of time thinking about, I think, I think this super aggregation concept is, is, is really interesting. I think there's real value. I think voice can really help there. So the early adopters like Vodafone have a head start and can really accelerate in that area. I think there's an element of, you know, the OTT providers and the whole ecosystem together needs to open its kimono a little bit and accept that what the customer wants, at the, you know, at the end of the day, they want access through a single point and they want to be able to use their voice to do lots of different interesting searches and solutions. So I think there is a interesting dynamic happening where that kind of interoperability is being forced on people, you know, in terms of different providers and different domains. But I think they'll get there. And I think the future, you know, is going to be pretty exciting when you have a single access point and voice potentially being the key to that. And um, I think that's coming soon. I think it's not just video. I think it is, you know, IoT, it's in the home and so all the domains Miguel talks about. But I think, you know, for me, voice offers the, the way to, to flatten all of those experiences like it does video. So I think it's, it's a good space to be in. I think it's exciting. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, all these insights. I think we've all seen that there are a lot of creativity uh, arriving in the search opportunities. Um, we'll see you in 10 minutes after the break for the next panel of this conference. Thank you for your time and have a nice day. <laughs>